Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Turian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing your with grace at ASEAN Dailies. We deliver news from Southeast Asia. Well, I hope you all celebrated the Valley yesterday with joy and also happiness with everyone, especially with your family and friends. And also, apparently, um, there is this guy, um, uh, Pravanti Rajesh, uh, who is a CEO of Sri Maha Mariman Temple. Uh, she uh, is receiving this blessing from this priest on the Dipavali yesterday. And of course, every Dipavali, uh, Mrs. Pravanti Rajesh, and also her family celebrate this festival of lights with some about hundred guests at her um, home and um, most of them they are not Indians or Hindus she invites uh, different races to share the joy and um, especially uh, the Chinese neighbors will always drop by to celebrate the day uh, with them and uh, while people who have worked with the temple such as their tentage vendor as well as often um, other neighborhood will come and visit them as well. So in fact, yesterday's fasted, uh, festivals uh, for her, especially, and her family started with the morning prayers, then later visit the temple before returning home to receive guests from 5 p.m. So it started all from the generation to generation. Uh, and of course, four generations of this family have been associated with 85 years old temple. And Miss, uh, Mrs. Pravanti, a former lawyer and temple volunteer, as she took on the CEO post 10 years ago. So this temple, uh, temple sees a few thousand devotees on Deepavali every year. And also the number has been steadily growing. So, with all those visitor flooding in during the Adipa Valley, uh, she wanted to uh, help them out. As well as this temple, in fact, has received some help. And they have around, uh, there are four residents priests at the temple. However, they have flown in three more priests uh, from India for this festival, uh, festive uh, season as well. And the Deepavali was celebrated at many places across the island, of course. And this Deepavali Mall, the bazaar opposite of Mustafa Center in the Sarangoon, they featured about 120 stalls as well as performances and on an on-site amusement park as well. So hope it was very memorable for all of you guys out there. And then to celebrate with the different races is another uh way of uh, celebrating this beautiful festival uh, around the world. Well, let's move on uh, to some updates for all the way from Myanmar. And it looks like, uh, well, of course, uh, after the Sunday's uh, the general election, and it's a historic election in Myanmar, where early results uh, is showing uh, to a sweeping victory for a national league uh, for democracy NLD. However, of course, final official result will not be known for days, and the elections were seen as the most democratic in Myanmar for 25 years. And results from these elections are slowly being announced. And the election commission says that NLD has taken about 78 of the 88 sixth, uh, I'm sorry, 88 seats announced uh, so far for the 440 seat lower house of parliament as well. So the quarter of uh, Myanmar's 664 parliamentary seats are set aside for the army and uh, for the NLD have the winning majority. It will need at least two thirds of the contested seats. 
And of course, this uh, USDP or the military backed Union Solidarity uh, Development Party has been in power in Myanmar since 2011, when the country began its transition from decades of military rule to a civilian government. And of course, Aung San Suu Kyi was brimming with confidence, and this was the leader who strongly sensed that her hour had come, and she said the time have changed and the people have changed. So apparently uh, about 30 million people were eligible to vote on Sunday, uh, the election in Myanmar, and turnout was estimated at about 80%. But these hundreds of thousands of people, including Rohingya, who are not recognized as citizens, they were denied a voting rights. And of course, when it comes to these small communities in Myanmar, uh, it also relates to human rights. And the group noted several problems, of course, including what I've mentioned just now, including this barring of members of the country's working as Muslim minority from voting, a lack of transparency in the advance voting process, and inconsistency in making a a preliminary results available at the constituency level. So there are still issues which are left behind untouched. However, uh, the result seems pretty positive on NLD and hope to hear more uh, updates from uh, Myanmar soon. So that's it for our breaking news and updates from Durian ASEAN. But stay tuned, we'll discuss and comment on the political side of Southeast Asia. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Drian ASEAN Year with Grace at ASEAN Dailies. We deliver news from Southeast Asia. Now, let's focus on the political news of Southeast Asia. Well, let's talk about the Singapore and China. Um, it was already reported that um, the whole the leaders uh, from both countries will have a meeting and also uh, to bolster these bilateral ties. And Singapore and China inked several crucial pacts and also they agreed to explore several areas of the cooperation to create opportunities for their people and business as well. And Prime Minister Li Xianlong and a visiting um, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping both witnessed the signing of the two agreement to launch this talk uh, for the China-Singapore Free Trade Agreement or CSFTA upgrade and also to start a new government-led project in southwestern uh, Chokkoin City. So another six agreements on the areas such as education cooperation, urban management and collaboration between these two custom authorities, they were also inked. And of course, the key highlight of the Mr. Z's visit uh, to mark 25 years of diplomatic relations was uh, the setting up of an all-around cooperative partnership progressing with the times. So both sides also agreed to further develop that these two flagship government-led projects, uh, Suzhou Internet Industrial Park and also Tianjin Echo City, as they voiced a strong support for the latest one. And uh, the China-Singapore uh, demonstration initiative or strategic connectivity as well. So both sides also agreed, uh, of course, to strengthen this consultation and cooperation on regional and global issues as well, and also the issues of common interest through the mechanisms such as the United Nations, World Trade Organization, and the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. So, seems like these both nations have been uh, pretty much building up the pretty uh, good relations, and also they have uh, explored, in fact, new areas of uh, cooperation as well. So uh, they are also targeting uh, the young people who need to understand the culture and history of both countries and foster this uh, deeper uh, friendship as well. And uh, of course, uh, the earlier um, they were together with uh, another minister, uh, Ko Chun Tong, they opened another story uh, that they can look into cultural part that they can cooperate each other. 
So this meeting uh, is pretty positive from a both sides and I hope that uh, Singapore and China can uh, go for the stronger relationship uh, in terms of economic as well as politically. Well, let's focus on the something uh, a bit more serious, which is about human trafficking. Well, human trafficking about well, let's talk about six months after the mass graves that, that were discovered in the Thai-Malaysian border. About 88 uh, human trafficking suspects appeared shackled in the packed Bangkok courtroom uh, to hear the panel of seven judges detail uh, the changes they face. So this case, which uh, implicates that this three-star general as well as influential business uh, businessmen from Southern Thailand, and are expected to take more than a year to conclude. So this intimid uh, intimidation of a witness had prompted uh, the authorities to move the hearing of the case from Southern Thailand to the capital migrant activity sphere. The list of more than 400 witnesses may be whittled down by bribes or continued threats to, to, to their safety as well. So about at least four uh, other military officers are accused of complicity in human trafficking as there are police officers and the former chairman of uh, Satun the provincial, uh, sorry, provincial administration organization. So this trial will begin after examination of witnesses and also evidence uh, about this week and also in court was led police uh, investigator Pawin Aposirin who quit his post last Saturday, saying the transfer order to a Thailand southern border provinces uh, would expose him to a risk of revenge and killing by trafficking gangs. So every year, tra human trafficking is an issue, especially in Southeast Asia. So there should be a uh, sort of a crackdown force traffickers to abandon their human cargo at sea and also create a humanitarian crisis after the Malaysia, Indonesia and Thai government initially repelled the pack boats as well. So it is something very serious and important to, to notice and be aware of that situations at the same time because when there were migrants of uh, late May uh, uh, both Malaysia and Indonesia to they agreed to give migrants temporary uh, shelter allowing more than 2,000 of them ashore. So uh, some of them are very necessary to take uh, immediate reactions to these uh, human trafficking issues. Let's move on to the next news uh, about our ASEAN committee is to set up in Netherlands as well. Well, Vietnamese ambassador to the Netherlands, uh, Jung Van Doan, has been elected as first uh, rotating president of ASEAN committee, uh, which was put into operation recently. So, of course, the committee was established on November 6th under the acceptance of ASEAN foreign ministers, the letter of approval by ASEAN Secretary General Lo Luang Min and also other relevant regula regulations as well. So the Vietnamese embassy chaired the committee first meeting, which was attended uh, by chief uh, representatives of diplomatic corps and also foreign ministers of uh, ministries of ASEAN countries in the Netherlands. So at the working session, the participants uh, reached consensus on the committee's orientations and activities in the bid to promote a 10-member group in Netherlands and consolidated this friendship between the bloc and the host country as well. So ASEAN groups, uh, which includes Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Myanmar, uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. It is the seventh largest economy in the world with a total GDP of 2.5 trillion US dollars. So it is something that we can uh, uh, hope for as well as to to see how this whole ASEAN communica uh, uh, community can move forward. Well, let's uh, move on to the last news of the political news, which is pretty uh, quite scary. Uh, it's coming all the way from Indonesia. They plan to use crocodiles to guard that raw drug convicts. So 
when it comes to drug trafficking in Indonesia, and also the policies are pretty strict. And apparently, the proposal is a pet project of anti-drug chef Budi Waseso, who plans to visit the various parts of the archipelago in his research for reptiles to guard this jail. So they will replay and uh, they will place as many crocodiles as they can there, and they also. Uh, will search for the most of ferocious type of crocodile. So he said the crocodiles will be better at preventing drug traffickers from escaping prison as they could not bribe. And you can't bribe crocodiles for sure. But he's also banking on the convicts lacking the crocodile running skills shown by um, another the movie that escaped from the island using the reptiles as a stepping stone. The plan is still in early stages and neither of the location or the potential opening date of jail have been decided. But this could be another way of preventing uh, preventing drug traffic traffickers for sure uh, because also the fear of these animals. So yes, that's the end of the uh, news on the political side. Stay tuned after this short break. You will come back to deliver news on the economic side of Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Drian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing your with Grace at ASEAN Daily, so we deliver news from Southeast Asia. So let's focus on the economic side of Southeast Asia. Firstly, let's talk about oil. And it looks like the price of oil will still stay pretty low until past 2030 as well. So it's really unlikely to return to about 349 ringgit a barrel before uh, the end of next decade. Well, it is also despite the unprecedented declines in investment. And in, um, in its world energy outlook, the IEA said it anticipates demand growth under its central scenario, which will rise annually by some 900,000 barriers per day uh, to 2020, gradually reaching a de- demand of 103.5 million uh, barrel by 2040. So their expectation is to, of course, see prices gradually rising to uh, about 80 US dollars around 2020. And they also estimate this year investment in oil will decline more than 20%. However, perhaps um, even more importantly, the decline will continue next year as well. So in the last 25 years, they have never seen two consecutive years where the investments are declining and this may well have implications for the oil market in the years to come, which is pretty worrisome and the investment has already fallen by 20% this year. So this higher cost of procedure uh, in Canada and Brazil as well as the US um, are likely to fall victim to low oil prices faster than, faster than most exporters. However, these declines could be offset by supply growth in Iraq and Iran as well. So really, they have to really think carefully about the oil security implications of a very few number of countries exporting this big chunk to the global market alone. And on the demand uh, aside, the IEA expects a total energy consumption in China, the world's largest commodities consumer, to be doubled uh, that of the US by 2014. But greater efficiency and a shift away from the heavy industry for economic growth will mean that China will need 85% less energy to generate each unit of future economic growth than it did in the last 25 years. Well, low um, near near-term global economic growth and also lasting switch by OPEC uh, to a policy of pumping oil at record rates to increase its market share and more resilient non-OPEC supply could conspire to keep the oil price lower for longer. So this scene remains close to about 50 US dollars a barrel until the end of this decade. Uh, 
before rising gradually back to 85 a barrel in 2014. So, uh, of course, the Middle East uh, shares in the oil market will end up higher than any time in the last 40 uh, years as well. Well, moving on to uh, another news about uh, this government prefer- prepares act to pave way for nuclear program. Uh, this was reported from Kuala Lumpur here. Uh, in fact, uh, they are preparing a new a table, a new nuclear energy act that will pave the way for the country to adopt nuclear power into energy mix by 2028. And this act could be tabled in parliament by next year. And also, uh, the original plan was to have a nuclear makeup at 10% of it. T- of generation capacity and this would uh, diversify the the energy uh, sources however since the unfortunate incident of Fukushima in Japan uh, it's currently taking more time to study it and this low commodity prices have also reduced um, uh, this whole uh, the incentives to develop the nuclear uh, program swiftly but not only are oil and gas prices low, but its coal is also at record low prices, apparently. And uh, the deadline has since moved to 2028, noting that about 13 years are plenty of time to study and develop a nuclear program. Normally, it takes about 10 years to develop a nuclear power plant. But dealing with this nuclear waste is one of the main issues that we need to really, really consider. For now, the government will place more focus on the renewable over energy sector which is targeted to about to make up of 20 th- uh, 23% percent of generation capacity by 2020 so apart from this nuclear energy act uh, the government plans to set up the institu- institutional infrastructure necessary for the nuclear program as well environmental and safety issues aside getting public support for this nuclear program might be a a challenging going forward especially if it is more expensive than the conventional power source so uh, there are more uh, things to talk about uh, when it comes to nuclear plantation and uh, really the uh, not only from the government but the public awareness and that their cons- uh, concerns towards the having this nuclear power plant is another uh, can lead to another issue. So, after all, this all this uh, removal of electricity subsi- subsidies and also introduction of fuel cost passed through the mechanism, consumers will need to bear the full brunt of higher generation cost. And also uh, not helping the case of the nuclear power is the fact that Malaysia is able to produce its own natural gas. So uh, that's it for uh, the news from economic side of Southeast Asia. Stay tuned. We have last segment, which will be focusing on the social cultural part of Southeast Asia. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Drian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. We are at um, Drian ASEAN Dailies where we deliver news from Southeast Asia. And you are at the last segment where we focus on the social culture part of Southeast Asia. So apparently there is a new uh, brand from Xiaomi. The company has just announced the launch of its new uh, MI Band 1S. Uh, it's Chinese company's second uh, generation wearable fitness tracker. And while the company first unveiled this band in China last year, also referred to as MI Band Pulse, has gotten such upgrades as optical heart rate sensor and design changes as well. So this new uh, gadget is slightly larger than the original version of the weight of a half gram more. It is a dust and water resistant and is supposed about a 30 day battery life on a single charge. And also this MI band pulse is currently only available in China with no word on its international launch. It will retail for um, about US dollar $16 here. So for or for those out there uh, who are all these um, 
Xiaomi fans and also users, you can you may want to check it out. There's a new gadget. And apparently, a study shows that eating homemade meals could reduce chances of diabetes, uh, which is pretty healthy, and the, the, it will reduce the risk of uh, developing types 2 diabetes as well. So those who ate two homemade meals, lunch or dinner per day, had a 13% lower risk of getting the disease. And eating homemade meals was also associated with less uh, less. Uh, overall weight gain in the middle age and also all the health professionals as well. So researchers look at the data from nearly 58,000 women in nurses health study and also more than 41,000 men in the health professionals follow up study. So the result is pretty much uh, out there and then well for those who like to eat outside well it's time perhaps to save money as well. Homemade cook I mean home cooked meals are much cheaper. And then moving on to the last uh, news about vaping in Malaysia, it just went very viral for the past few months. And in fact, um, the banning a vaping industry, how about the uh, consumer side, but not only that, but how about the economic side? And uh, this move will definitely kill the vape industry, which is run mostly by young Malay entrepreneurs. And uh, this is something a bit it has become more serious than before and of course it is very important to meet with stakeholders in the vape industry to look for this win-win situation and also introduce the clearer laws from both buyers and sellers as well so this um uh, in a statement by the health director general Dr. Dr. Her, new Hisham Abdullah. The ministry stated that, that e liquid containing nicotine could only be supplied by the licensed pharmacists and also registered medical practitioners as well. So you will um, require uh, to be registered under the control of drugs and the cosmetic regulations and sales of liquid must also be recorded as well. So this comes as uh, several vape shops. Um, had their premises raided last week and also uh, uh, the business they really want to expand these young vape traders to expand their business and it is necessary to call on them to uh, make Malaysian vape products world famous well it's it is as much as that uh, the business is going very well and at the same time uh, this industry has been uh, gaining a lot of popularity among especially younger generation but uh, it also needs to be discussed properly uh, with how it is going to be uh, sustain its business in Malaysia not only Malaysia but in Southeast Asia as well so that's it for the news from uh, Adrian Asian. Stay tuned for the next interview as well as look for us uh, at our website adrianasian.com and we have our social media channels Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter.